Hi, I'm Nick Thomas and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing. And I'm Esther. So I'm answering the questions that you asked on uh, Wednesday. So there were, uh, yeah, quite a few questions. So there's three videos, 18 uh, questions per video. So uh, let's get going. Yep. Okay. So in your opinion, what is best rigid interpretation or personal preference? Uh, my opinion on that is um, rigid interpretation is generally better. So it, it is generally best to look at what the sources say and follow them. Um, and yet, um, in your aspiring things at like that, I do um, like to throw in a few other things that I, that I know, have learned from other systems here and there. Um, but when I'm teaching, I'm very much, this is how it's in the manual. Maybe if I've got some other thing I've, I've learned or like, I'll mention it and I'll specifically mention that it's not, um, it's not part of the, of the manual. Um, it's, it's always better to go back to the manual and see what it's saying. Uh, even, in your, even if in your sparring you do throw in a few extra things. Because ultimately, of course, not everything um, uh, you know, in a system can be documented within that manual. Um, but you should always ask yourself, why are you doing something different? Um, because when we're in full HEMA gear in a modern sports setting and we're having fun and not trying to kill each other, the reason some things might be done could be very different to how and why they were done with sharp swords back in the 18th and 19th century. So do be a little bit careful that you don't modify things too much, uh, just from a modern perspective. Um, your opinion on priority versus the afterblow? Yeah, um, I've been through endless numbers of um, rule sets for, uh, for sort of tournaments and things like that, because this is what we're talking about. As far as your normal sparring, is concerned, you should just take a good, uh, you know, sensible approach to it. You don't need to worry about it. As in terms of, you know, point scoring in a in a sportive tournament setting, I've been through every method there that I think uh, has been put out there. There'll always be something new, I'm sure. But and I've never found either system to be ideal. Uh, I find it far better that you just get the right mindset from people going into the tournament rather than worry about strict rules, if you like, is that, uh, you know, if people are focusing on not being hit and getting clean hits, um, you don't have to worry about it too much. But then it does, of course, depend what kind of, you know, players you get in your tournament. Um, I think both work and both have massive drawbacks. So I don't have the answer to it. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of tournaments anyway. I have my time of, of fighting in them. Still do occasionally, um, but I, I think for British military swordsmanship, tournaments are best treated as a fun extra um, and, and not as, as the goal because you, you will change the way you fight to, to win that tournament and win under those rules um, rather than follow the methods that, you know, that are being taught for a martial system. Okay. So, spadrooms, dumb or totally awesome? Well, obviously, they're totally awesome. Of course. Um, I've proved, shown in so many videos why um, spadrons can be good. There are some real junkers out there, um, and there are some awesome swords. But ultimately, you know, it's just a you know a light back or a light broadsword. It's, there's nothing particularly revolutionary about it, um, or a, or a straight saber if you like. Um, in which case, it's just a whole family of swords. There are some good ones and there are some bad ones. The overall principle of a um, medium length cut and thrust sword is is really not revolutionary. So uh, yeah, there are some really good ones and there are some really bad ones, but uh, it's, 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 it's overall, it's a, it's a good sword form, no doubt about it. And remember, there is the Spadruna group on Facebook if you want to learn more. Just a nice little plug there. Um, so your opinion on lethality, lethality and degrees of rotation with a strike using an infantry saber, AKA what's the damage on a flick versus a moulinette versus a full, you know, from the shoulder body swing um, with a huge wide up and how much does this match the uniform as well at the time for cutting um, angles? Yeah, um, in terms of a flick, if it is literally just a flick, you know, got to define it is the problem. If you go from a high outside guard and you throw like this, you can definitely generate enough power to do serious damage. You're not going to cut off a limb, but again, this is not a stick fight, it's not an armoured fight with maces, this is a sword fight with unarmoured um, opponents. And if I, for example, from here, 
just from the wrist, throw like this to the head, that will be enough to do significant damage. Will you necessarily die from it? Not necessarily, but not every shot is about killing. It's about um, incapacitation is often uh, a major reason to land a hit on somebody. And how will it differ? Well, if you rotate, if you get full rotations going, and specifically if you throw in some shoulder and elbow, you can generate massive, massive power. Um, we need to do more tests. But I have seen and I have done cuts against you know meat and stuff like that, and thrown cuts that just slice right on through, just with throwing cuts like that. Now the tippy tappy stuff that some people do just to really you know screw with you in a fight, so they'll be in a guard like this and do that. That's really quite sad, um, and is is really not going to achieve much. Although, once again, if you add in a draw to that, it could obviously add some more. So yeah, this is nice and blunt here. So if you do a tippy-tap strike and actually slide with it, you're getting a slice in action, in which case it's going to do something. And if that is towards an exposed area like the hand, the face, the neck, that's going to be effective. Um, Again, the emphasis on, 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 the, on the art of defense is uh, getting in with fast cuts and not getting in with the most powerful. Um, but yeah, you need to, do, you need to do a load more cutting tests on different targets to see how that power is going to be, be effective. But yes, you can absolutely do significant damage by doing cuts with small range of motion. You can do effective cuts. Now, how would that work? Uh, so that's against exposed flesh. How would that work against clothing? Um, depends what they're wearing. If you're talking about great coats, then they are they offer actually a massive amount of protection, um, even from thrusts in, in some cases, uh, and that would be an interesting one to look into. And certainly if you're using a, a spadroon or a lightsaber or a light hanger, you wouldn't want to be cutting against that kind of heavy duty gear. Um, yeah, so it, it, that, that is a vast subject that needs a, a lot more looking into. Okay. So, do Vic um, later Victorian straighter sabers, sabers handle like spadrons? Um, they can. Um, so, when you get to the um, just a few years after the Napoleonic period, these two swords were both in use at the same time. So, this is the line infantry officer's sword. So, that's your your regular um, officers, and this is your flank officer's sword, which is, you know. Um, light infantry officers and grenadiers and stuff like that but there was a little bit more to it than that, there was a bit more crossover but um, they combined effectively into one sword and that's where you get the 1822 infantry officers sword which was initially a pipe back and then they went to the 1845 which is the Wilkinson Fuller blade and you can see that they basically took the ideas from both so you tend to have the agility of this one um, and, and the protection that the, the shells offer with the curvature and the cutting of this one, and they kind of merged the two together. And as a result, um, 19th century sabres compared to spadroons can be quite similar. Now, the overall trend is that, this, that the sabres are heavier, but that's not always the case. I've seen some Spanish sabres, actually, that are lighter than some spadroons that I've got. But yeah, if you look at British examples, so British infantry sabres of the Victorian period tend to be, you know, eight to 900 grams. When you think a spadroon, was normally seven to eight hundred, and their overall size, their mass distribution is not vastly different. Um, they don't, so British infantry sabres then didn't fuller to the tip like a spadroon does, and that means they can have a little bit more mass in the, in the end of the blade. But again, it depends on the individual examples. So this one I'm holding here, this actually has the mass and the balance of several uh, Victorian era infantry officers' swords that I've got. Um, and lots more that I've handled. So this one, uh, this is an NCO sword, by the way. Um, this is very much like a lot of um, Victorian infantry sabers, yeah. So they can be very similar. And of course, because they had quite low curvatures on them, they aren't so far from a straight blade anyway, those Victorian swords. So yeah, th they can be quite similar, but the overall trend is for them to still be a little bit heavier with a little bit more mass. Do you ever find examples in British military swordsmanship of instead of a lunge and recover, you intercept the opponent's attack upon preparation? Yeah, this is what uh, time shots are all about. That is what timing is. So timing is interrupting your opponent's uh, motion. So they change guard or they attack you, um, anything like that. And rather than go into a parry or go into a guard, you strike at them. And not in a double, double hit kind of way. You've got to be safe doing it. 
So um, there are lots of examples of that. Obviously, the obvious one is somebody goes to your leg, you step out and strike them in the same moment. So that's timing. So you strike, you struck them in their attack. Um, but there are all kinds of um, timing shots that exist, both in cut and thrust. And all it essentially is, is when your opponent, as I said, disengages or goes to strike, you strike straight into them. And yeah, that's an example where you're not slipping, you're not going back to defense, you're not, you know, you know, you're just going straight at them. So yeah, time shots. Or cool. timing. Quite a long one. So, do you agree with the decisions made towards the thrust-centric blades at the cost of the ability to deliver a cut that will take the opponent out of the fight, especially when a thinner blade is used to penetrate um, lessens the chances of the wound hitting a major organ, such as through the heart or the centre of the lung. So, whilst these would be more fatal wounds, they are going to cause your soldier to be stuck with no means of defence with his opponent within striking distance. Yeah, so there's, there's two things there, is that do I think it's worth compromising a bit of cut for, for the thrust? Um, generally, yes. Um, so if you take something monstrous like a 1796 light -like cavalry saber, um, it does have massive cutting power, and yet it's, it compromises so much in agility to, to get that. And I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I think the cavalry swords that followed it, um, that were, had lesser curves and lesser mass in the tip, um, were a better idea, is that they're still powerful cutters. Uh, and that can be said for infantry swords as well. You still have a, enough of a cut. Um, now, obviously, some of the lightweight spadroons, they do compromise a lot. Again, depends which spadroon you're looking at, because some of them have good mass in them. And this is, again, a good back sword, really. Um, now, in terms of the damage that's been done, the issue of how much damage is done on a thrust, well, most of the swords that... Um, that, that are fairly thin for um, cut and thrust, they're still quite broad blades. And if we look to um, rapiers and small swords and stuff like that, talk about them doing less damage because they won't hit uh, things like the heart or whatever. Actually, if you look at uh, medical um, uh, works from surgeons and stuff like that in the 19th century, um, they've said actually that it's more to do with um, where the body is hit than necessarily the width of the blade. Um, one good one I read, for example, said that abdomen wounds don't tend to stop people immediately, despite the fact that they often are fatal, um, whatever they're actually hit with. Whereas with the chest, it's not about hitting the heart. They found that a hit on any part of the chest almost immediately incapacitated somebody immediately, no matter where on the chest it was and how thick the blade was. And once again, a lot of these cut and thrust blades are actually not that narrow on the tip because most swords actually do, do taper to um, a fine point. Things like the flared cavalry sabers are a rare exception to that rule. Um, most swords do taper to a fairly fine point. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that going to narrow blades compromises the immediately incapacitating nature quite as much as you think. Um, but yeah, I think it's worth compromising a bit of that power. I don't think going for these massively flared light cavalry style, uh, 796 light cavalry style blades was a particularly great idea, even though I love them as a sword. Um, so they had their place, but I think um, compromising a little bit for a bit more thrust and a bit more agility in the point is a good idea. How were naval dirks used, and were some like alehouse daggers or true parrying daggers, being the first official pattern was 1856? Right, so naval dirks, um, uh, we don't know much about them, this is the fascinating thing. Now the fact is most people actually, um, in most books, say that they're just for midshipmen, which isn't quite true at all. They were just um, used by all naval officers as an alternative to a sword, simply because they are convenient. So, you know, day-to-day -day duties, um, a sword gets in the way, it's a pain, pain in the arse, especially on, on a ship. So they went to using these, which they called dirks, and it is as it looks, it's a dagger. They can sometimes be curved, but um, this is about the most common um, sort of style of the late 18th century. And as you can see, it kind of follows the look of a spadroon of the time. Um, how were they used? We absolutely don't know. We have no idea. Um, day to day, they were just worn for self-defense and as a symbol of uh, authority. In terms of accounts of combat, I have not seen any at the time. Um, actually, I saw one 
which was kind of uh, interesting where um, an officer was about to um, be run through with a bayonet and the officer beside him parried it up with a, with a dirk um, but the gun went off and took the head off of the, uh, the officer so it didn't go so well. Um, there are other accounts of naval officers going into combat with a sword and dagger but it doesn't say dirk so it's not clear whether they were carrying their dirk in as an offhand weapon or another kind of dagger. It would be logical that they would carry it in, say with a, a cutlass, spadroon, sabre in one hand and, and the dirk in the other, so it's logical it would be. And in self-defence, it's just a knife, it's just a dagger. So we absolutely, we don't know. That's short answer. Oh, and uh, were any like an alehouse dagger? Alehouse daggers are basically like a basket hilt dagger, effectively, or semi-basket hilt dagger. And no, naval dirks were not made that way. Naval dirks were like this. Um, the only exceptions in protection being is they sometimes had a side loop like um, uh, like that spadroon and they sometimes had a chain guard that went from the, the, the knuckle bow, sorry the quillen, to the pommel. Simple chain guard like you see on early sabres. That's it, there were no sort of alehouse dagger looking type things. So uh, yeah that's it. Oh this is an original by the way, this is from about 1780. Okay. So, can you talk about historical training swords outside of foils, single sticks, or P1864, such as wasters or steels? Um, no, <laughs> because um, generally they, they, they weren't used. Um, so, the idea of having a blunt training sword, blunt steel training sword, is a very Victorian um, concept. Now, there were examples of um, gladiatorial bouts being done with blunt steel and stuff like that. But but we're talking about training in swordsmanship and, and no, so you get to the 1864 uh, gymnasium training sabre, that was the first of its kind. Around that time they were blunt and some cavalry swords to use, but as far as we know they were for drill. Um, and certainly in the Napoleonic period I've seen no reference to using blunt um, training swords at all. So um, the, simply put, the, the only training tools that were commonly in use were the foil, so this is an antique um, foil, and the single stick, which is just a leather or wicker basket on a, on a, on a stick, and um, I've only ever seen reference to those two methods being used. Uh, that is absolutely it. So um, what we're doing today with using um, you know, steel training saws that represent the original swords isn't accurate or representative of training methods of the Napoleonic period. But of course we're trying to simulate not just the training that they were receiving, but the fighting that they may go on to do, which is why we want to have swords that represent um, the original swords rather than just their training swords. Otherwise if we wanted to just represent the training we would just use foil and single stick. Uh, we also of course have way better protective equipment these days which also enables us to train with more realistic uh, training swords. Um, so yeah, and then this is where things eventually went with the British. So you have the 1864 and then later on they went on to these, um, which is the later gymnasium sword and it's straight, quite light in, in the uh, foible, so it hits light and it flexes really well and you see it has a nail head on it, loads of hand protection. This is where it eventually went and you can see this looks like a very heavy juicy sport fencing saver, which is basically what it is actually, it's about a kilo in weight. It's quite heavy but it's most of the weight's back here. So yeah, this is a very Victorian concept to have dedicated steel training swords. Okay. Can you explain civilian sword use of the 19th century, such as used by off-duty officers, sword canes, and who had court swords? So court swords at that time, they were just for ceremonial use. They were for wear, um, for fashion, for uh, authority and that kind of thing. So they just weren't a daily wear thing. Um, Small swords had, had long gone out of uh, fashion, but was really seen happening in the late 18th century. So small swords were just not really seen in wear anymore. Um, but yes, you're quite right, the police did indeed use um, cutlasses, um, and they were taught according to the, the Angelo method, and then eventually had their own manual, which was in, indeed based on the Angelo infantry methods. Um, and um, sword canes. Sword canes? There's not much written about. Um, there are a few manuals, uh, I believe, in the late 19th, early 20th century, but again, it's way beyond the period I'm, I'm talking about. And, um, we, yeah, we just don't know. Uh, and the thing is, they're more a, a deterrent or, you know, poker sort of thief in, 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 the, uh, in the chess kind of thing. We just don't know. Um, 
I would say the likelihood is they were just used according to the methods that people were learning with um, uh, with walking sticks or, or with their um, foil training because again chances are if you carry a sword cane you probably practiced foil um, so you'll probably do something like that with it but yeah um, I don't know and I'm not aware there are a huge amount of accounts with them how, how would you use a sword cane what kind of blade is it most sword canes look like a sharpened foil so like a square section blade with just a tip on it I have got one but I didn't get it out as a prop for today um, there are some that are edged but, but they're so lightweight they're incredibly light they are basically they handle like a foil that is sharpened so you're just going to stab people with it so I wonder how effective are Zwerchhaus in the Sabre system? I feel like it could be pulled off even though the guards could sometimes be in the way. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Zwerchhaus are... Uh, so you usually have the, the thumb on the back of the grip and you snap in strikes like this. Um, and, you know, they call some people call the helicopter of death kind of thing because it's that rotation above you. Um, Obviously, it's not in the in the system of British military swordsmanship, so it's not something we do. Um, could it be done? Yes, I suppose, and and yes, on the on this side, you could in theory, in theory throw in the point or a sharpened back edge. Could it work? Yes. Um, for these grips, I, I don't think it provides much purchase. And I think there's a good chance you're going to lose your sword. Um, and if it's got a fair amount of curvature and a fair bit of mass like this one has, you're going to be quite unstable with it. So I really wouldn't recommend it. And, and the system is always about keeping the guard on towards your opponents for protection. And when you do that action, we completely expose the hands to do it. So um, I, I don't think they'd be. Uh, I don't think they're a very good idea um, for this particular weapon. Although I do like to use them for a bit of mesa training from time to time because, you know, that's what you should be doing with the mesa. Is there any way of back step or quick step without the risk of breaking your guard? Um, personally, my favourite way of always um, going backwards, uh, particularly for you two at distance, is to use the um, Mathieson slip method. So your, your, foot slip, your right foot slips past your left, you go up onto the ball, and then you can step back after that. So you're able to maintain a right foot, right shoulder forward, sword forward guard, and just the, the basically your, your feet are moving under you. I think that's what. Yeah, that's what you're obviously after. it's different to traversing. So yeah, yeah. Did the British develop much of their own sword play? Oh no, that is a um, um, a duplicate. Apologies. Um, what would officers use as training aids for swordsmanship and physical development in Napoleonic and later times? Most specifically, what would they use to simulate striking and cutting targets like pels or dummies? Yeah, so the pel, which is you know tends to be a wooden target, sometimes padded, um, that basically you strike against, and it's it's you know it's a, it's an ancient training method, um, but I have seen no reference to it in the Napoleonic period. And as far as training was being done, I've only seen training being done with um, single sticks and foils, done as solo drills and then as partner drills. And so I think the likelihood is there weren't any, um, as far as we can tell. Um, that doesn't mean that some instructors or uh, masters didn't you know, add them onto their training, I don't know. But certainly I've not seen them in illustrations of the time, I've not seen them in descriptions of the time or manuals. Um, when it comes to something like uh, Roeth and various other manuals, they, they had a pull-out diagram of your six cuts and you just put it on the wall and you train in front of it with your cuts so you weren't actually striking the targets, you were striking through your targets. And um, yeah, so I'm not sure there was a static target to, uh, to train against at that time. So can you tell me against false edge strikes in British military swordsmanship? Yeah, so in the Napoleonic period, there were no false edge strikes taught um, as far as the surviving manuals that we've got. If we work back to some of the um, other manuals of the 18th century, pre-Napoleonic, so it's the same lineage, there are a few examples, and I do mean a small few, um, and that is um, a false edge strike up to the hand, like this, 
and the other example is after striking um, sorry after striking against the blade that we've gone further out past our target we can strike back a horizontal strike to the face so you've gone basically it's a reverse cut six if you're inside the opponent's guard and uh, really that's it so you've got this ascending strike towards the hand and after so the opponent's blade will be here you've passed them you can snap back a back edge into their face that is in the earlier sources and there's every possibility that people in the Napoleonic period were still looking at and reading those sources. Maybe they used them. Um, maybe people like Roth and Angelo had more to teach than they showed in their manual, quite possibly. So, yeah, you could throw them in there if you wanted to. There, there are a few, but they are rare, really rare for British swordsmanship of, of all those periods. Okay, so what are accounts of people dual wielding with cutlasses? Um, and uh, were they much more common with sabres of the era? Were they more common with cutlass? Yes. Um, to be honest, dual wield is, is just rare um, in European swordsmanship generally. I mean, there are exceptions to the rule, like, you know, sort of case of rapiers and side sword sort of being paired. But the cutlass being used uh, one in each hand, that, that's, that's not common either. Um, the only reason that it could possibly happen is because on a ship it's obviously a confined space you're drawing weapons there are the weapons on the deck you're not sort of marching off out to war or a battle kind of thing which is why in naval combat there tends to be so much more hand-to-hand -hand weapons available they're, they're stored on the ship everything's close up close range so you know everybody's essentially armed to the teeth compared to the way they are in an infantry battle um, there are examples of um, cutlass and pistol being used together cutlass and dagger and saber and dagger um, of bayonets being lashed to the forearm, um, forearm of the left hand, both to parry and also to strike with. So you just, rope, you just lash it on the rope, um, reversing the pistols and using those to parry with. I don't think I've necessarily seen cutlass in each hand. I'm sure it will appear at some point, but it's it's it's, it's a rarity. Um, and then, as you can see, that's why it would be even rarer with the saber because you know you're not just drawing weapons from from a stores when you're out on an actual pitch battlefield or something like that or on the march. So you've got what you're carrying, which is your one sword. Do you think the dual wielding of cutlasses has been, I don't know, almost uh, romanticised with things like, you know, Amboni and Black Sails, things like that? Do you think it is just because it's like a romanticised idea? Is that why there is this popularity and this love for it? Yeah, I, I suspect so. I suspect it very much is, is, is a movie um, trope. Um, but again, I, it probably happened at some point, but, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that's common or that I've come across. So what's your opinion of backswords, and do you think they're underappreciated in HEMA? Okay, so, um, backswords. Here is an original backsword that I own, it's from about 1620. Um, yes, they are actually awesome swords, and yeah, they probably are underappreciated. Now, a backsword is just a, um, a sword with a single edge. So it's, it's only sharpened on the one side, it's got a solid back. They can sometimes still be sharpened in the last uh, few inches of the blade, so they can technically have double edges, but the double edge is, is only as far as the last few inches go. Um, there's no reason to not like back swords. They're awesome, and ultimately, as I've already said, um, this uh, back sword is actually very similar to a decent weight spadroon. So um, this spadroon is 720 grams, and this basket hilt is 970, and of course, a lot of the extra weight is in the basket. The actual blades are not vastly different, so they handle quite similar. Um, and so it's unsurprising that I like a good backsword. So um, backswords can come in different weights, but if you look at uh, William Hope's descriptions, he describes backswords as being light cut and thrust swords. So even though technically you can find heavyweight backswords in museums and stuff like that, they're more commonly agile cut and thrusters like this one. And therefore, of course, I like them. Ultimately, a back sword is just a straight saber anyway, um, and I like sabers, so why wouldn't I <laughs> like back swords? Um, when you get to the 18th century, terminology changed a little bit. So at the start, you had terms like shearing sword for spadroons. Shearing sword and spadroon is the same thing, but the shearing sword is specifically double-edged, whereas the latest spadroon can be double or single. Um, and back swords, of course, you know, naming a sword by how many edges it has is not very helpful because you could have a very fast, agile back sword and you could have an incredibly heavy one, which is why as terminology went on in the 18th century, um, 
this will be called a broadsword, um, even though it's not far off some spadroons, but because it's of a fair weight and it has a basket hilt on it. So yeah, the term um, backsword tended to vanish, as did Shirin sword. So um, anything that's light cut and thrust, no matter the edges, will be a spadroon. And anything that was a bit heavier and or had a basket hilt would be a broadsword. So um, the backsword is, is kind of stuck there in the middle. It's, it's, um, it's a term that is not so widely used. Um, it can refer to both light and heavy cut and thrust swords. It's a bit of an odd one. Um, but ultimately, how different is this to a broadsword? Well, it, you know, it isn't, especially as you can sharpen the last few inches. It just happens to have one edge for, for this part. You can get light broadswords as well. So, um, yeah, that's why I tend to prefer the term broadsword in the, um, the way it's used in the 18th century, because it can refer to single or double-edged basket hilts. It makes more sense. But uh, yeah, back swords are good swords. Absolutely. I mean, this is an excellent fighting sword that I'd be happy to use in any situation. It's, a, it, it's all round. Um, it's got good reach. Uh, it's got good cutting power. Still got good thrust. Good hand protection. So yeah, back swords are awesome. I've got no problem with them whatsoever. And a good spadroon is, you know, is a back sword anyway. Is that it? Nope. One last, last question one last. and then we're done. So, how does um, British military swordsmanship differ from other saber methods from other countries, such as Spain, Italy, France, and Prussia? The that is a difficult one to answer because for this style, I just stick to British military swordsmanship. So, I go to other countries for the styles, like I teach Italian rapier and stuff like that. But as far as uh, military swordsmanship goes, I just love the British stuff, so I stick with the British stuff. Um, but you know, there was a lot of French influence with British swordsmanship, um, and that kind of um, sort of uh, crossover of arts did tend to happen a lot across European countries, so you're going to find lots of similarities. I fought and trained with people who do all kinds of different sabre styles, and, you know, there are loads of things in common. You don't see sort of radically different things coming into play, in my experience. Um, so, yeah, um, but... You know, you'd have to in study in depth those other styles to really say. And personally, um, I just focus on the on the British sources for this particular period of weaponry. Okay. Any closing thoughts? No, no. I, I think that's it. Um, I think it's been an interesting video series. Um, maybe we'll do some more. Uh, maybe I'll post to ask me about spadrons. I'll have a think about that. But uh, I do hope you've enjoyed it. Have covered everyone's questions. That was. Um, on point to the uh, Q&A session and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video and if you haven't subscribed please do so.